where she organized an, an exhibition on Giovanni Bellini's remarkable painting of St. Francis in the Desert. She recently co-authored a scholarly volume dedicated to the painting, which my students and I have very much enjoyed reading. As exhibitions research assistant at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, she is presently engaged in research and public programming for forthcoming exhibitions of Italian painting and sculpture, including Della Robbia, Sculpting with Color in Renaissance Florence, and the art of Andrea Verrocchio. Bringing together works of art to make an exhibition provides the opportunity to consider issues from new perspectives. The paintings assembled in the Venetian Visions exhibition have challenged us since their arrival in November, prompting us to consider both the innovations of lesser known artists <coughs> such as Cima da Comeriano and the scope of the legacy of major figures such as Giordano. The paintings feature some traditional themes, but each also departs from tradition, such as by combining pastoral landscape with religious imagery. Dr. Rutherglen's interest in ornamental paintings used in the homes of Renaissance Venice allowed her to explore that genre as one in which artists had the freedom to experiment and introduce new subject matter. Similarly, the paintings in Venetian Visions have afforded their artists the opportunity to introduce change, as Dr. Rutherglen's keen eye will illuminate for us. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Susanna Rutherglen. Growing up nearby in Charlottesville, I never would have dreamed that the National Gallery would travel from London to the Blue Ridge Foothills. We are very much indebted to the organizers of the exhibition for bringing this opportunity to our region. Um, please join me in giving them a round of applause. My topic today is landscape painting in Renaissance Venice, with an emphasis on works One could practically write a textbook on this subject with paintings from these museums alone. So rich are they in works relevant to the Venetian landscape tradition. Sure. Can we hear around the back? No, it needs to be louder. Known as Red Bull. 
we can imagine the complete vision of resplendent heavenly gold against which the virgin and child once appeared, comparable to an earlier gilded altarpiece by Paolo Veneziano. Moving about 40 years forward in time, we encounter Cima da Conegliano's Madonna and Child of circa 1505. Here the subject is the same, the Madonna with the infant child playfully stepping on her lap in a posture very similar to that of Viverini's Jesus. But the rich backdrop of gold has given way to a view into space, an imagined landscape of hills, rivers, bridges, churches, houses, and winding pathways. The abstract vision of heaven, symbolized by solid gold, has been displaced by a view of a world that we recognize as our own, even a continent away and at more than five centuries distance. During the short decades that separate the paintings of Figurini and Chima, landscape came into its own as a subject of Italian Renaissance painting. In the works of artists such as Giovanni Bellini, Piero della Francesca, and Leonardo da Vinci, evocation of the natural world became a central concern, even a fascination, first overtaking the backgrounds of traditional painting types, such as portraits and religious icons, and eventually graduating to the status of an independent genre. Landscape even came to rival the central subject of all Italian Renaissance art, the human figure as demonstrated by Chima's David and Jonathan on view in the exhibition. Typically, the biblical hero David's victory over the Philistine giant Goliath offered an occasion for Renaissance artists to represent the heroic or sensual male nude figure, as in the classic sculptures of Donatello and Michelangelo. In Chima's version, however, it is the interaction between figures and landscape. David's journey with his companion through a variegated countryside of castles, rivers, and mountains while carrying the severed head of Goliath that forms the painter's theme. The transformation is so complete that only a generation after Antonio Viverini's Madonna and Child, his own son Alvise painted a scene of the hermit St. Jerome against a richly described landscape background. How and why did natural imagery assume such importance in 15th and 16th century Italian painting, and what meanings did it carry? Broadly speaking, the emergence of landscape in Western art during these years belongs to a larger awakening of interest in nature and the physical world that characterized the Renaissance, the period of intense cultural and intellectual change that began around 1300 AD and continued for the next three centuries both in Italy and in Northern Europe. While elaborate landscapes have played an important part in the art of Hellenistic Greece and ancient Rome, their precedence declined during the centuries after the fall of the Western Roman Empire in the fifth century AD. For the next millennium, Christian art, with its emphasis on the spiritual and the symbolic over the earthly and sensuous, rendered naturalistic landscape imagery marginal. Yet the classical ideal of country life and the nostalgia for human existence in harmony with nature were never entirely lost. In the first century BC, the Roman poet Virgil, in his bucolic verses known as the Eclogues, had given life to the songs of country shepherds, lovelorn exiles from the city, who implored, Sing on, now that we are seated on the soft grass. Every field, every tree is now budding. Now the woods are green, now the year is at its loveliest. Moving forward from ancient Rome to early Renaissance Italy, we find authors and artists rediscovering and warmly embracing Virgil's pastoral ideal of the shepherd poet at home in nature. Petrarch, the 14th century Italian humanist and poet, acquired a manuscript of Virgil's writings, also on view in the exhibition, and sought to revive the Roman author's ideal of natural quietude. During his multiple sojourns in a secluded valley, Petrarch clothed himself as a shepherd and dined on bread, grapes, figs, and nuts. Here he composed letters and a treatise extolling the virtues of solitary life, as well as a short work on monastic retreat known as De Otio Religioso. In declaring that he was 
book, by nature a lover of silence and solitude, an enemy of the courts, Petrarch cast himself as a recluse in the humanist mold, virtuously abandoning city life to engage in private rumination and composition. In tandem with the literary rediscovery of ancient pastoral poetry, there emerged a new interest in representing the natural world in the visual arts. Virgil and the pastoral ideal formed a major strain of influence, especially in 16th century Italian paintings of shepherds and nymphs in Arcadian settings. But a variety of contemporary influences shaped the genre as well, including artists' pattern books, manuscripts, and Netherlandish oil paintings. In addition, a rich scriptural and religious tradition informed Italian Renaissance painters' attitudes to the natural world. It was no single source or event that called artists to the landscape. Their interest was stimulated by a range of visual and literary materials and reflected a growing general preoccupation with the workings of nature throughout early modern society. My emphasis today is on the emergence of landscape in the Venetian artistic milieu, on the rich diversity of sources and influences that shaped this school of painting, on the varying meanings of landscape from one work to another, depending on artist, subject matter, and viewer, and on the relationships between figure and setting that developed once the undifferentiated pictorial background gave way to a convincing impression of depth. Human beings have always defined the natural world against or in relation to communal life and the city, and nowhere more so than in Renaissance Italy, whose most innovative and varied tradition of landscape painting emerged in Venice, above all in the art of Giovanni Bellini and Giorgione. In the 15th and 16th centuries, the Republic of Venice was not only a busy metropolis and trading post, it was also an entirely artificial city, built from the lagoon waters up in wood, brick, and stone. It is no coincidence that the Victorian writer John Ruskin's monumental treatise on the architecture of the city is titled The Stones of Venice. For although vegetation was more plentiful in the Renaissance city than it is in the modern one, greenery has always been relatively scarce here, appearing in unexpected places and always subordinate to the urban fabric. It is in Venice, where the very ground one walks on is fashioned by human hands, that nature herself is imagined and constructed in the realm of art. And it is in Venice, where the lack of nature is felt more keenly than elsewhere, that art is called upon to bridge the gap. One should also remember, however, that in the 15th and early 16th centuries, Venice was the capital of an empire with vast land holdings in Italy and throughout the Mediterranean region. This map shows in bright green um, only a small part of Venetian territory up here at the top of the Adriatic Sea and the star is Venice itself. <coughs> Venetian landscape imagery also reflects artists' familiarity with the terrain of North Italy, where many of them were born, regularly traveled for commissions, and also took their vacations. Giovanni Bellini even owned a villa on the Italian mainland, and his sojourns there may have inspired some of his more elaborate landscape inventions. Giovanni's father, Jacopo Bellini, was the first major Venetian painter to experiment at length with the possibilities of representing the natural world in painting and drawing. Born around 1400, he emerged from the tradition of late Gothic Italian painting but ran a family workshop that produced two of the most important masters of Renaissance painting in Venice, Giovanni and his brother Gentile. Jacopo's Madonna and Child with the kneeling donor of circa 1440 depicts the Virgin Mary seated in humility before an expansive view encompassing a sky with trailing clouds over a landscape of walled towns and a seemingly endless range of mountain peaks. However, the relationship between figures and setting remains hieratic and not subject to the laws of earthly space. Like a mountain herself, the Madonna seems to tower over the open background. The holiness of the Virgin and Christ child places them in a realm apart from their surroundings. And they are seated on a ground of abstract meal fiori vegetation, similar to that found in medieval tapestries. 
The figure's monumental size is particularly pronounced in comparison to the diminutive deer at lower right and the donor who kneels at left, perhaps Leonella d'Este of Ferrara or one of his brothers. The Virgin's mantle is dotted with particulate golden light. Here, Jacopo has used powdered gold rather than the more traditional flat gold leaf that we've already seen in Venetian altarpieces. The gold models the physical volume of her drapery, tracing the ridges of folds rather than filling in the background of the image. Gold dots also dust the trees and hut to the right of the Madonna's sleeve, suggesting heavenly illumination of the physical world. Jacopo here employs traditional gold as he would colored paint to describe the fall of light. A similar fusion of new and old representational techniques is evident in the halos of the Virgin and Child. The Madonna's halo is flattened like the gold plate discs of early Christian icons, while the Christ Child is foreshortened in a modern, spatially accurate manner. It seems to recede backward as we would actually see it in physical space. Thus, Jacopo plays here with the conventions of space and landscape, especially by using gold in some places as a tool of naturalistic representation, and elsewhere in a more iconic mode. Jacopo's most enduring contribution to Venetian Renaissance painting was a pair of drawing albums, today in Paris and London, which are roughly dated between the 1430s and 1470, and were described as quadros designatos, or drawn paintings in early documents. Landscape, nature, and perspective studies dominate these books, which mark a transition toward the production and use of increasingly complex experimental drawings in the Renaissance artist's workshop. <coughs> Elaborate landscape compositions often fill two facing folios within the books, as in this spread depicting the stigmatization of St. Francis. The saint appears against a rugged backdrop of steep mountains dotted with animals, including deer and dogs. Here, Jacopo is working out of a tradition of animal and nature studies invented in northern Italy by his rough contemporary Antonio Pisanello of Verona. Detailed individual motifs of leaping or standing creatures fill the artist's painting of St. Eustace, who, while out hunting, saw a stag with a crucifix between its antlers and was instantly converted to Christianity. The basis for such compositions was Pisanello's model collection, comprising studies from nature of animals, plants, and the human figure. These drawings depart from the stock patterns and figure types of medieval model books, adopting a more lively, closely observed approach to the spirit of living things. This example contains studies of a pair of rabbits facing each other, a top, a single rabbit, a deer, a fallow deer, and a seated man. These few motifs recur constantly in Venetian landscapes. In the lower right corner of Jacopo's blue Madonna, for example, a similar seated deer appears in diminutive form. And the motif of two rabbits facing each other at upper left of this drawing proves even more popular returning in later landscape paintings such as Vittore Carpaccio's Meditation on the Passion, visible at far right, here, along with another deer, also probably derived from or inspired by Pisanello's sketchbooks. Giovanni Bellini's St. Jerome Reading of 1505 also prominently features the detail of two rabbits with noses touching. These patterns demonstrate that artists not only observed and transcribed the natural world in their painted landscapes, but also assembled and creatively responded to pre-existing artistic conventions and motifs. Pisanello's legacy of close, expressive study of nature, as well as the medieval tradition of manuscript herbals depicting medicinal plants, partly inspired one of the most exquisite botanical studies of the early Renaissance. Returning to Jacopo Bellini's sketchbooks, we find an image in watercolor and gouache of a life-sized purple iris, Iris Germanica. The work shows fine modeling and painstaking empirical observation in the service of poetic appreciation. Especially compelling is the artist's use of the blank space of the page 
to lend monumentality to a single specimen. The work has a highly finished quality, yet the fading out of the watercolor toward the bottom of the stem suggests that this is still fundamentally studied. The work recalls the watercolor landscapes and nature studies completed by the German artist Albert Dürer on his first trip to Italy around uh, 1495. Beautifully observed flowers are to, are to become a staple of Venetian Renaissance landscape paintings, including Titian's monumental Bacchus and Ariadne of at least 50 years later, which includes several irises in the lower right corner that were lavishly praised by the 19th century critic John Ruskin. The iris in Jacopo's Louvre sketchbook is so singular and so different from the other studies in these volumes that it has been attributed by some scholars not to Jacopo, but to his son Giovanni, portrayed here in a medal by Camelio at the National Gallery of Art. Whether or not we support this particular attribution, there's no disputing that Giovanni Bellini became the master of sacred and poetic landscape in 15th and early 16th century Venice. Born probably between 1424 and 1435, Giovanni trained in his father's workshop. His earliest known independent work was a landscape a finely wrought scene of St. Jerome in the desert, and he may also have gained experience during the 1450s in a small-scale format of manuscript illumination. Giovanni's scene of the agony in the garden in the National Gallery London is dated circa 1465 and has been called the first great independent landscape in the history of Italian art, a work in which the natural prospect has graduated from a subsidiary or background role to become the protagonist of the entire painted narrative. Bellini's ostensible subject is the episode from Christ's Passion, after the Last Supper and immediately before his arrest, when he retired to the Mount of Olives to pray. Here, he suffered through a sleepless night with the foreknowledge of his imminent death on the cross as his disciples slumbered peacefully. Toward morning, an angel appeared from heaven and gave him strength, causing him to pray more urgently. Bellini has faithfully represented the sleeping disciples, the angel in the sky at upper right, and in the distance, the approaching soldiers led by Judas, who are coming to arrest Jesus. But otherwise, the artist departs completely from pictorial tradition. Christ kneels to face the dawn, transfixed before a panorama of light in movement over land that rises to embrace a variable sky. Soon the sun will have filled the upper regions of the clouds. The angel toward whom he looks is diaphanous, nothing more than an early morning apparition. Once the sun has advanced across the slopes, this momentary conjunction of light and vapor will have faded. In a split second, indeed, every aspect of the vista upon which Christ gazes will have changed. The London Agony in the Garden is a supreme example of what the scholar Luba Friedman has called religious pastoral, that is, a fusion of sacred and poetic landscape. Bellini's scene recalls not only the gospel account of Christ's passion, but also the poetry of the Old Testament Psalms. The Lord's night of pain, followed by his eager leaning into the dawn, recalls their evocation of the fervor of devotion. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say, more than they that watch for the morning. Christ's longing figure, physically oriented toward the low hills, suggests not only his supplication in the garden, but also the words of Psalm 121. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. And the vast spaces before these hills, the reaches of brown earth, winding paths, and green hills leading off to the east, recall the capacious grandeur of God's creation, matched only by his saving power. As far as the east is removed from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Gazing over the same landscape as Christ does, the spectator becomes aware of his identification with God as an incarnate human being, who perishes like all the living things of the world on which both are gazing. As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. 
Thus, in Bellini's image, the metamorphosis of the landscape portends the passing of human life. The 16th century masters following in Bellini's footsteps similarly used landscape to capture that most elusive of phenomena, the passage of time. A work known as Il Tramonto, or The Sunset, which is sometimes attributed to Giorgione, depicts a horizon just grazed by the light of a rising or setting sun. The tempesta evokes the humid crescendo of a coming storm, the moment when the atmosphere's equilibrium breaks. In representing such transitional moments, these works both quicken our sense of the drama of the events described and announce their maker's mastery of the temporal art of poetry. The Agony in the Garden is an early work of Bellini, painted circa 1465 in the traditional medium of Egg Tempera. Over the rest of his career, however, the artist's landscapes evolved along with his use of drying oil, which sets much more slowly than tempera and has a thicker, more body and fluent consistency. The artist's adoption of oil technique and its accompanying possibilities for tonal variety and compositional detail may have been inspired by Netherlandish paintings, especially portable works such as this small picture of St. Francis attributed to Jan van Eyck that was documented in Venice in 1471 and likely inspired Bellini's monumental image of the saint. The Netherlandish masters were gifted inventors of the landscape and oil, and it is to their influence that we must partly attribute, it, attribute its phenomenal rise in the art of the Venetian Renaissance. Two paintings by Bellini of the Madonna and Child from the Metropolitan Museum exemplify this development. The earlier Davis Madonna in Tempera at left shows a paler palette with relatively coarse modeling and clear divisions between forms. The later Rogers Madonna in oil at right displays richer, more saturated color, a more convincing sense of volume and glowing depth, and subtler gradations between one form and another. Both include landscape backgrounds, but that of the Davis Madonna shows a harder-edged design, while that of the Rogers Madonna reveals a greater tonal range and the use of atmospheric perspective, whereby more distant mountain ridges are shrouded in blue haze. The poetic evocativeness of the landscape in the Rogers Madonna is largely a function of the artist's technical advances in the use of oil. However, it is important to remember that Bellini did not abandon egg tempera wholesale for oil, but incorporated both media into his practice over time. And in both the early and late works, the meaning of the natural background is analogous. By placing the Madonna and Child in a familiar landscape, Bellini represents the miracle of the incarnate Christ, a child who was born and walked the earth as we do. Winding paths and a wealth of incidental detail in these landscapes invite the viewer to undertake a meditational pilgrimage, to traverse the fictive space of the painting while contemplating the sacred image of the Madonna and Child in the foreground. Landscape in both works arrests our attention, calling us to traverse a world created by God and sanctified by his presence. The meditational landscape was elaborated with particular success by Bellini's younger contemporary, Vittorio Carpaccio, whose meditation on Christ's passion we have already examined in relation to the nature studies of Pisanello. In this and other works, Carpaccio embeds richly expressive narrative and symbolic motifs in the natural surroundings of his holy figures. This work shows the dead Christ seated on a cracked and ruined throne in a desert setting flanked by two aged holy men, St. Jerome at left and Job at right. Born about 350 AD, Jerome was a father and early doctor of the church who was known for translating the Old and New Testaments into Latin. He's accompanied here by a lion, right there, who according to legend became his devoted friend after he removed a thorn from its paw. Job, the protagonist of the Old Testament book bearing his name, was the upright man who refused to abandon his God in spite of countless misfortunes. Both men appear as wizened hermits, and Carpaccio conveys through delicate modeling the harshness and stringent quality of the ascetic body. 
The figures are human expressions of the desert landscape surrounding them. As the art historian Frank Jewett Mather wrote, these weather-beaten forms seem an emanation from the sands and blistering sunlight. Their appearance is especially poignant compared with the youthful but dead body of the Savior on which they meditate. Without delving too deeply into the complex and much debated symbolism of this work, we can observe that the background is divided into two parts. First, a rough, rocky, and hilly precipice at upper left, populated with wild animals and gravestones. The contrast between Jerome's tame lion and the wild cat attacking a deer on the hill above is especially striking. At right, meanwhile, the landscape opens to a calm vista of a town with banners flying and cultivated hills culminating in an extraordinary cloudscape. At center, above the figure of the dead Christ, an upward soaring bird evokes the flight of the soul from the body. This binary landscape construction, separated by the body and soul of Christ, calls us to read these surroundings as symbolic of the savage old order before Christ on the left, and the era of salvation ushered in by the sacrifice on the right. Also significant is Carpaccio's attention to what we might call the landscape of the body. His Jerome and Job are among the earliest portraits of the aged human body in the history of Western art. And the painter's nature studies extend beyond animals and plants to include the, the human anatomy. For example, Jerome's rosary is actually composed of human vertebrae. And his staff is a hand clutching a bone. These macabre details rhyme with the more standard skull and bones cluttered over the ground, symbolic of Golgotha. They remind us that the distinction between figure and setting is not so sharp as we might assume, and that any study of landscape must also encompass the relation between human and natural realms. One may wonder why Job, a protagonist of the Jewish Old Testament, is present in this work venerating the dead Christ. In fact, the Old Testament prophets enjoyed an unusually strong presence in Venetian art and architecture. Following Byzantine practice, a number of churches in the city are dedicated to such figures as Moses, Job, and Jeremiah. It is in, it is in this context of veneration of the Jewish fathers that we may look more closely at the landscape of Chima's roughly contemporary David and Jonathan in the exhibition. David was the shepherd boy who secured the Israelites' victory over the Philistines by killing their, their giant warrior Goliath with a stone and slingshot, visible here tucked into his belt, then decapitating Goliath with his own sword. According to the first book of Samuel, after David presented the head of Goliath to Saul, the king of Israel, he developed a close friendship with the king's son, Jonathan. Jonathan is rarely depicted in Christian art, so there has been some debate about whether Chima's painting actually shows David returning in triumph with his close companion. As the catalog of this exhibition notes, however, the shadows cast by the figure's legs and feet are merged, indicating a shared direction and purpose, and their attitudes suggest close comradeship, reinforcing the identification of the second, taller figure as Jonathan. How did Chima conceive this unusual subject, and what role does the extensive landscape background play in the work? The artist has placed David and Jonathan in an environment very like the Venetian mainland, with a castle perched on a rocky massif at left, a peacefully meandering river, and a walled town giving way to a view of foothills and distant mountains at right. The view is somewhat evocative of Chima's hometown of Corneliano, north of Venice in the foothills of the Dolomites. The artist often recalled Corneliano in the backgrounds of his works, most famously the altarpiece of St. John the Baptist for the Church of the Madonna del Orto. By including the familiar landscapes of the Veneto in his sacred paintings, the artist encouraged viewers to transplant the holy stories to their own time and place, and to consider their present day <coughs> implications. Here, the serene setting the tranquil town and prominent fortress suggests that a peaceful and well-ordered society is founded on feats of heroism, such as David's, 
and encourages the spectator to emulate the Israelite hero's valor and cunning if he were ever to face a seemingly unbeatable foe. The presence of Jonathan may likewise remind the viewer that friendship and cooperation are, are indispensable tools for leadership, particularly in the face of the political and military obstacles the Venetians were facing in their mainland domains in the first decade of the 16th century, the very mainland domains which are imaginatively represented in Chima's landscape. Other aspects of the natural scene resonate closely with the biblical account of David's victory. The foreground is scattered with rocks, which bring to mind the simple rock with which he slew the giant. The surroundings also represent David's pastoral origins as a shepherd. Indeed, when King Saul initially questioned the boy's qualifications to fight Goliath, he cited his experience as if he were in a job interview, tending his father's sheep. If a lion or a bear came and carried off an animal from the flock, I would go after it and fight it and rescue it from its mouth. And if it attacked me, I would seize it by the beard and strike it down and kill it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and that Philistine shall end up like one of them. This dramatic passage recalls the wild animals attacking each other in Carpaccio's meditation, a reminder that the nature we see in the National Gallery painting is not benign and tranquil by design, but must be pacified. Finally, David's victory over Goliath was thought by Christians to prefigure the episode recounted in the Gospels when Christ fasted in the wilderness for 40 days and was three times tempted by the devil. David's triumphant return with the head of Goliath also anticipated another gospel episode, Christ's entry into Jerusalem before the Passion. Thus, the Jewish hero of David's journey through the landscape ultimately evokes the peregrinations and the trials of Christ in the land of Israel. Interestingly, the theme of decapitation in Venetian art is often paired with landscape. Around the same time that Chima completed his David and Jonathan, his younger contemporary, Giorgione, painted a scene of Judith stepping on the head of Holofernes against a pastoral background. In both works, landscape perhaps offers a counterpoint to the drama of military conflict. Yet for Giorgione, as for Chima, it also carries meanings specific to the narrative depicted. According to this episode recounted in an apocryphal book of the Old Testament, Judith seduced and decapitated the Assyrian general Holofernes to save the people of her native Bethulia, who were under siege by his armies. In the background appears a distant town, which is no doubt Bethulia. The sensual violence of the story contrasts with its protagonist's expression of demure contemplation and with the, with the gentle countryside that unfolds outward from the tendrils of her hair. At Judith's feet grow identifiable species of wildflowers and plants, including white grape hyacinth and sylvan tulips. The maiden's surroundings, a low stepped wall with plant creepers bordered by flowers and grass, evoke the Quartus Conclusus or closed garden of the Virgin Mary. And indeed, in texts of the period, Judith appears as a prefiguration of Mary. Yet the artist also presents Judith as a beguiling temptress. The image of a young lady in a budding spring, juxtaposed with Holofernes' lifeless crown, suggests the power of a woman's beauty alone to topple even kings and generals. The glorious weather and Judith's serene enjoyment of it serve to soothe and delight the beholder. They also manifest the well-being and security of the people of Bethulia. The heroine's surroundings are bathed in a pearly atmosphere that softens contours and blurs distant views. In this way, the standard narrative of Judith's victory is absorbed subtly into her surroundings. The artist avoids telling the story, and textual precision gives way to subjective effects of oil, the optical experiences and moods that are the province of the Cinquecento Venetian brush. These innovative techniques and approaches to subject matter are the legacy of Giorgione to the Western landscape tradition. Here I quote the art historian A. Richard Turner on another work by the artist, the Castelfranco Altarpiece. 
In this landscape, one experiences in purest essence that artist's feeling for form. All is blurred, edges and surfaces consumed in a diaphanous light. Whereas Bellini's light cleansed and revealed forms in their pristine clarity, this artist blurs forms and touches them gently with warm light. The morbidezza, softness, and sfumatura, smokiness, of the modeling melts tactile forms in favor of a lush optical impression. To this I would add that the work's impressionistic technique corresponds to its suggestive and enigmatic composition with content and execution equally <coughs> governed by principles of improvisation and poetic license. Giorgione's contribution to Venetian landscape painting cannot be fully assessed without considering the personality of the artist and what has come to be known as the Georgianesque style. The painter was called during his lifetime Giorgio from Castelfranco, after the mainland Veneto town in which he was born, possibly around 1477 or 78. He may have come to the metropolis of Venice by the turn of the 16th century. However, he's not mentioned in any document there until 1507, only three years before he died of the plague at a young age. He's portrayed here in Carlo Rodolfi's 17th century artist biographies known as the Maraviglia dell'Arte. Long before Rodolfi, however, the artist's biography was already confused and colored by the myths that had grown up around his abbreviated career. The exact number of works painted by Giorgione remains much disputed, and there are a large number of so-called Georgianesque pictures that display his style and inventive approach to subject matter without necessarily being autographed. The only securely dated work by Giorgione is a portrait of an anonymous woman called Laura for the branches of laurel behind her head. A 16th century inscription on the reverse of the panel indicates that it was completed on the 1st of June, 1506. The woman is veiled and wears a fur-lined red coat which she opens to expose one breast. At an early stage, the background of this work consisted of a pale blue sky and a distant landscape, which was altered by the artist to the present dark background with laurel leaves painted on top. Such dramatic changes are characteristic of the artist's improvisational working process, and they also support an argument made by some scholars that Giorgione was aware of, and even inspired by, the Florentine Leonardo da Vinci's portrait of Ginevra de Vinci that we saw earlier. In both works, a woman appears before an allegorical plant, Ginevra with the juniper that puns on her name, and Laura with the laurel of poets. The fact that Giorgione first included a distant landscape in the background of the portrait also suggests that he knew Leonardo's exemplar. Both artists paid special attention to the plants behind their figures. In Giorgione's case, the laurel leaves are beautifully painted and edged with golden light. It has been noted that courtesans in early 16th century Venice often took the name Laura, and that the sensuality of Giorgione's figure supports her identification as such. But the earliest description of the painting interprets the laurel as a reference to the poet Petrarch's beloved, Laura, and by extension to the crown of laurel worn by poets since antiquity, as Petrarch himself wears here in his 16th century portrait. The theme of pictorial poetry indeed pervades Giorgione's works. Although he painted a number of religious pictures, the artist may also be considered the pioneer of the purely secular landscape poesia inspired by ancient and contemporary sources. The English critic Roger Fry wrote that the artist's sleeping Venus, now in Dresden, might best exemplify the spirit of the Italian Renaissance. And indeed, if we accept the canonical definition of the Renaissance as the rediscovery of antiquity, of the natural world, and of the human body, this work is a defining expression of the period. The painting depicts a full-length figure with her right arm bent behind her head in the gesture of slumber typically found in Greco-Roman art. The artist must have been aware of the type of the sleeping Ariadne from Hellenistic sculpture 
visible here in the Roman adaptation of the second century AD. The image also recalls the well-known type of the Venus Pudica, the goddess who modestly covers her nudity with one hand. Although the painter has upended this convention by lending the figure's gesture a demonstrative and erotic charge, the work has been altered and originally contained a small cupid as well. The literary origin of Giorgione's composition may be found in the classical Latin epithalamium, a poem written for new brides. In the late 4th century, for example, the Roman poet Claudian wrote an epithalamium describing Venus resting on her couch in a green bower. Giorgione's painting counts as a painted epithalamium rivaling ancient poetry, for it was likely commissioned by the nobleman Girolamo Marcello on the occasion of his marriage in 1507. The setting of Giorgione's nude is also literary in inspiration. It was common among both ancient and Renaissance <coughs> authors to equate the female body with landscape. In Giorgione's painting, the curves of the figure are echoed in the gentle hills and path through the countryside, while distant mountains echo the shape of her breast. In this way, the painted landscape affords a metaphor for the female form, a very different meaning than is carried by the sacred meditational landscapes we studied earlier. The trope of a beautiful nymph in a pastoral landscape also appears in Renaissance literature, such as Giovanni Boccaccio's 14th century collection of novelle known as the Decameron. Boccaccio tells the story of Simon, a rough and unrefined young man who retreats to the countryside, where he chances to enter a clearing in a wood and find the sleeping beauty Iphigenia. According to Boccaccio, Simon began to consider each of her features in turn, admiring her hair, which he judged to be made of gold, her brow, nose, and mouth, her neck and arms. Having suddenly been transformed from a country bumpkin into a connoisseur of beauty, he longed to be able to see her eyes, but they were closed in heavy slumber, from which the girl gave no apparent sign of awakening. Simon set out to be worthy of the beauty's love, and in four years transformed himself into the most <coughs> refined, graceful, and talented man on the entire island of Cyprus. Regarding the painting with Boccaccio's story in mind, we can identify the sleeping nude as a type of Iphigenia, and ourselves, the viewers, as stand-ins for Simon. Chancing upon the vision of a sleeping nymph, we too are transformed into refined connoisseurs of beauty. The painting thus may be understood as a commentary on the power of beauty to inspire us to cultivate the best aspects of ourselves. Giorgione's poetic style deeply influenced the art of the young Titian to the degree that it is sometimes difficult to tell works of the two artists apart. This problem comes to the fore in one of the most famous landscapes of the Venetian Renaissance, the so-called Fête Champetre in the Louvre. The attribution of this work has been passed back and forth between Giorgione and Titian for many years, and it has also been given to lesser-known personalities, such as Domenico Mancini. In short, the painting exemplifies the Georgianesque style, works created in the poetic spirit and under the thrall of Giorgione, but perhaps not by his hand. The Fête Champetre presents a pastoral Arcadia in which two young men, seated on the grass, one in elaborate city dress and the other in more rustic attire, lean toward each other to converse in hushed tones as one pauses his hand over his lute. They are accompanied by two nymphs, one leaning on a well with a crystal pitcher, the other turned away from the viewer with a simple flute in hand. Groves of trees, green verges, and hills give way to a view of a distant plain, while in the near background appears another musical shepherd. It has been suggested by one scholar that the two nude women who accompany this musical and natural reverie are invisible to the, to the two young men. They are nymphs of the wood who have been attracted by the sound of their music and join their gathering. Whether or not we subscribe to this interpretation, it is clear that the women are personifications of the landscape in the same manner as the Dresden Venus, the curves of their bodies rhyming with the gentle topography of the natural world to which these youths have retreated. 
As well, the suggestion of both music and silence, the, pig the figures pausing over their instruments, invites us to listen closely to this silent painting and to conjure the musical sound of nature. As in Jacopo Sanazzaro's Arcadia, a Renaissance pastoral composed in the 1480s. Many elms, many oaks, and many laurels, whispering with tremulous branches, waved over our heads, and the hoarse murmur of the water, which running rapidly through the green grass, went seeking the level plain, all together rendered up a sound most pleasant to hear. And among the shady branches, the shrilling grasshoppers wearied themselves with singing in the heat. Here is the most sublime expression of Georgianesque landscape, a living paganism in which the sanctity of nature and her all-pervading influence are felt just as we feel them in the finest classical literature. The Fet Petro raises the central question <coughs> of how early 16th century Venetian landscape paintings relate to literary pastoral. Is this a purely poetic landscape, the world of Virgil's epilogues and San Nazaro's Arcadia? As we have seen, the genre of prose and poetry centering on shepherds and their songs reaches back to antiquity and was revived during the Renaissance in the vernacular Italian writings of Petrarch, Sanazzaro, and others. It is, it is important to recognize, however, that pastoral is not so much a literary type as a theme and a set of conventions that transcend any one medium, with expressions in poetry, drama, architecture, and music, as well as painting. It's possible to speak of pictures such as the Petro Petro as pastoral works, and even to compare them with excerpts from pastoral poetry without identifying a precise literary source for their compositions. Indeed, by escaping a one-to-one -one correspondence with any particular text, these works announce their originality as painted poems, on par with early modern literary efforts to breathe new life into this age-old form. In this spirit, I'd like to close my discussion today by examining the work titled Homage to a Poet in the exhibition here at the Mayor. Like the Louvre painting, this work exemplifies the Georgianesque style. Its author has not been conclusively identified, and one scholar, on the basis of the hairstyles and costumes, has dated it to the 1540s, well after the artist's death. The work's subject is uncertain, and it has been given various titles, including The Golden Age and Saturn in Exile. The present title refers to the enthroned figure of Wright, robed in brilliant orange, who is crowned with laurel and backed by a spray of laurel bushes, symbolic of poetry, very similar in design to Giorgione's Laura. <coughs> Indeed, the work seems to celebrate the poet's accomplishments. Several books rest against or on the steps of his throne, a kneeling figure presents him an offering, while another sits on a lower oh, sorry, another sits on the lowest step and strums a lute. The entire composition is evocative of altarpieces in which the virgin and child are adored by saints and angels. The stepped throne, the baldacchino or umbrella over the enthroned figure's head, and the seated lute playing angel or supplicant. Yet here, the object of adoration is the artist in his native habitat, immersed in or even presiding over nature, the source of his inspiration. In his writings on poetry, Boccaccio declares that the poet's muse, quote, never seeks a habitation in the towering palaces of kings or the easy abodes of the luxurious. Rather, she visits caves on the steep mountainside or shady groves or argent springs where are the retreats of the studious. His remarks belong to a long tradition locating the artist's inspiration in nature, in peaceful places far from the bustle of the city, where he retreats to find otium, the engaged leisure necessary to the creative process. Here the poet's retreat is populated by animals, recalling the nature studies of Pisanello. The wildlife includes a leopard and peacock, very similar to those seen in a Venetian painting known as Orpheus in the National Gallery, Washington as well as an owl and a green bird perched near an escarpment in which a diminutive hermit is crouching, recalling hermit saints such as Jerome, who formed a popular subject of religious landscape paintings in 15th and 16th century Venice. 
In his landmark book on the history of landscape in Western art, Kenneth Clark divided the genre into various types, the landscape of symbols, the landscape of fantasy, ideal landscape, and so forth. Today we've examined paintings fitting into a variety of these categories, from sacred meditational landscapes that invite traversing by the imagination, to pastoral idols inspired by Latin and vernacular poetry. To these we may add a type that encompasses all the works we've seen, and is expressed most clearly in the homage to a poet. That's the landscape of art, the natural world as a locus of and metaphor for artistic inspiration and the artistic process. Whether sacred or profane, religious or pastoral, the field of landscape afforded Venetian painters an opportunity to reach new heights of technical and poetic sophistication, to imbue their works with exceptionally rich and layered illusions, to the extent that these masters began to privilege the natural prospect as the central bearer of meaning in their works. It is up to us, however, to discern the rich and complex messages of painted landscape across time, not least because the historical conception of the earth and humankind's place in it <coughs> deeply informs our own relationship to this world in the present day. Thank you. Um, 
for artists at this time that they would have seen in the world around them the creation of God. They would have. <laughs> they would have. And that with friends in particular, this appreciation for landscape was given greater profound um, and spiritual meaning. Uh, so I don't think that they made distinctions to their historians of the day between secular and religious. Was there any backlash from the church as the religious figures shrunk in size and nature became larger? Did the church feel that uh, they were going to lose in the end? That's a great question. I think a lot of these early landscapes we're looking at were in domestic settings where um, the, the church's reach wasn't as basic. There was more room for experimentation and um, development of uh, non-canonical renderings of subject matter, traditional religious subject matters. Um, but we do see landscape coming into altarpieces as well, and uh, major altarpieces. So it, I think that if we give these works a spiritual reading and see the landscapes as deepening um, the religious message, uh, that that's our perhaps our only way of understanding how such revolutionary changes were been sanctioned by the church. Is it really completely unreasonable to assume that these are the precursors to people like Galileo and you know who start to see? Nature is, uh, you know. Oh no, it, it's, that's a wonderful point. I think that in the case of Galileo, um, he actually lived in Venice and studied, worked at the University of Padua. And the painters of the occupation with the natural world uh, is continuous with scientific exploration of that world. And we also have to keep in mind that not so much in Venice, but in other areas of Italy, artists were also scientists. Leonardo da Vinci being the most obvious. So um, I'm actually working on another paper about Galileo, and he was at the University of Padua and he discovered the phases of Venus. And uh, I, I believe that this discovery has something to do with um, representations of planets and sky painting at the time. So. Venetians actually are better. Yes, exactly. Other thoughts? Yes. Uh, one thing that struck me that that bizarre Carpaccio painting of the dead Christ is, is how it breaks the traditional rules of you know, the Old Testament being on Christ and the New Testament on the right. And, and then why is the gnarly landscape behind Jerome and that, you know, I mean, so many crazy inconsistencies there that sort of plays into of the, the sacred and profane getting all word. Yeah. There would be, I think, in traditional binary landscapes, you're saying that the um, Old Testament and the New Testament were on the other reverse sides as they were shown in the Bible. Yes, I actually hadn't thought too much about that, but it's very interesting um, the way he was completed. Uh, he's maintained the binary structure, but he's changed things around quite a bit. Right. But it's such an exotic painting in the first place. We wouldn't be surprised to see it um, in dispensing the tradition in that way as well. I have a technical question. Bellini early on is mixing oil and tempera. Uh -huh. What parts of the painting is he using tempera in, and what parts is he using oil in? And does he give it up by the end of his career and paint only in oil? I'm just curious about that transition in Italy from temper to oil. Well, that's a great question. Uh, in, in, first of all, the use of oil has been found in very early works by Bellini. That uh, in the Courier Museum Transfiguration is an early work that sampling has shown that oil is used there. So he's using oil almost from the beginning um, of his new career. And he's mixing in temper in a variety of ways. Sometimes there's a portion of the painting in oil, say a foreground figure, and then areas of the background are in tempera. That's true of the San Giovanni altarpiece. But elsewhere, they're being mixed or layered 
so there would be a temporary rasha where pepper and oil are used together um, and the a unified thing. So um, it's, I don't think that, just as there's no binary between um, sacred and profane, temper and oil were seen as polarized <coughs> they were seen as parts of this toolkit. Jay, Susanna, thanks so much for your talk, by the way, and you were able to bring together so much material to talk about this tradition in a very cogent way. I was just curious, a lot of the works that um, you highlighted are made for elite patrons, and like you we just talked about, privately displayed. Um, and they're experimental, um, and that's probably one of the reasons. But what happens when they move to the public sphere? How does the representation of the landscape change in something like an altered piece? Should the Kessel Front go an altered piece? But how does this sort of more private, emotional medium change once we, we get into the public? <coughs> Well, that's a very interesting question. They don't have to defer to you on your opinion about all these oh. matters. <laughs> but, um, I think in the case of the Coastal Franco altarpiece, uh, that was made for a provincial town. It wasn't for the Venetian capital. And it's an extraordinarily unusual, offensive experiment in the composition as a whole. But it was also not seen by standard barriers of, of convention in Venice. So in a way, the fact that it was at some remove allowed for innovation that would be more typically associated with the private realm. But thinking about uh, major Venetian altarpieces, um, you know, Giovanni Bellini in a very a later work, um, San Giovanni Chrysostomo altarpiece, also has a quite unusual design which shows St. Jerome um, and then the saints of the Eastern Orthodox Church. Um, and doesn't even, um, it includes the Christ child with St. Christopher, but no Madonna. So there, the iconography is just completely being upended. And maybe at, by that point in his career, he felt comfortable um, doing that kind of work or he had a supportive patron. But uh, it is a, it's a difficult issue, for sure.